Hello and welcome back to this damn philodualistic crusade. Today I'm talking about the 1940 horror science fiction classic Dr. Cyclops, uh, presented here from a new 4K scan on Blu-ray from Kino Lorber in a really wondrous looking disc. This is really the first horror film to ever be photographed in true three-strip Technicolor. Uh, before this point, you only had the two-color Technicolor classics, Mystery of the Wax Museum and Dr. X, uh, that were horror films that were in true color. But this was the first to be done in the three-strip classic Technicolor process, making it a, a real landmark in the genre and uh, even more impressive with the technical feats that are carried off in this film and all the effects shots uh, because it was uh, much more uh, difficult to do uh, with the Technicolor three-strip process, particularly early on with the big bulky cameras and having to actually shoot three individual pieces of film uh, at the same time for the entire process. Production. That would be a hard sell for any studio to do, uh, particularly with a project that was in the horror realm when horror films were not really as in vogue. They just finally started to come back. But the people who had the vision to do this and the ones who actually pulled this off were, of course, the legendary team of Marion C. Cooper producing and Ernest B. Schoedsack directing the film. They had been the team behind King Kong, The Most Dangerous Game, Son of Kong, uh, last Days of Pompeii, and of course this would be the last film they would make before the outbreak of World War II, uh, which unfortunately meant that after the war, the only other film that uh, they would make together in the last film Chosak would direct is Mighty Joe Young in 1949, which also is full of special effects and is sort of the the, the, the final end note to their career together is sort of a, a nod to obviously King Kong and Son of Kong. Dr. Cyclops is unfortunately a bit overlooked. It's, it's a little bit more obscure, uh, although the imagery from it, it, might be, it would be instantly recognizable to anybody who ever saw it, particularly if you saw this film as a child. And it's actually quite ahead of its time and influential in ways, in, in addition to just being the first horror film to be photographed in three-strip technical because it deals with uh, the the story element of people being shrunk down to a minuscule size. You immediately think of The Incredible Shrinking Man, and this is very much like sequences in that film, but, you know, 17 years ahead. Uh, it also harkens back to some earlier films, especially the 1936 The Devil Doll, which also involves a mad scientist and shrinking people down to, uh, to a minuscule size. Here, the, the elements are very plainly obvious that you, you get the sense of they are definitely mixing some elements of their previous successes. So the fact that the mad doctor, Dr. Cyclops, is, who is played wonderfully by Albert Decker and the, the best performance in the film, because it's really the only showy part there is, uh, it he is in a remote jungle area where there's a, a laboratory. Once the various individuals are subjected to, to his shrinking ray, uh, they are in a hostile jungle type environment. So once they overcome their immediate obstacles, then they're sort of thrown into a uh, most dangerous game type scenario where they are actually hunted back down by Dr. Cyclops, who's trying to recapture them. So you get this sort of Zaroff and Rainsford vibe there in a jungle set. That, but uh, instead of it being Skull Island or the Skull Island sets from King Kong that they used in Most Dangerous Game, here it's the mad Dr. Cyclops chasing after the miniaturized people with a butterfly net and a little case. So uh, it makes all of the dangers much more enormous, obviously. <laughs> and because this is Cooper and Shodzak, they do run into legitimate dangers. I think uh, one of the big standouts is, of course, when they, they, they deal with a cat. Again, 17 years before The Incredible Shrinking Man, there is a a cat that is a extreme menace to the shrunken down people who are hiding in uh, essentially cacti, the cactus plant that's uh, right next to the lab. And in fact, that the shot of the cat, which is obviously an optical effects shot, 
uh, is very similar, very strikingly similar to the sequence in Incredible Shrinking Man, where uh, Grant Williams opens the door of the dollhouse he's living in, and there's the cat's face right there, which is, of course, a horrifying image. Well, here's the immediate precursor of that. Uh, once they're out in the jungle, they face all, all kinds of uh, interesting bits and bobs, and I, I really enjoy the fact that uh, they, they even run into an alligator, which, of course, is it's got to be absolutely horrifying at that size. Uh, but also they have to deal with the fact that they're being chased by someone. He may be unhinged. He may be insane, but he's not an idiot. Uh, so he you know, does sensible things like when they're hiding in uh, dry grass, he sets it on fire. So the, 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 the stakes are continually raised. And it, it makes for a very entertaining film that is enhanced by the very bold and striking three-strip Technicolor usage. And it's fascinating seeing a Technicolor film from 1940 in true three-strip Technicolor that's a full-on horror science fiction fantasy adventure film. So you get all the fun stuff of King Kong and Most Dangerous Game for fans of Cooper and Chodzak's other films. Plus it has some uh, fun materials from previous films like The Devil Doll and some flavor of classic pulp magazine science fiction type stories and there were uh, novelizations and magazine versions of this story and it's debated on uh, where exactly the story originated but when you read a lot of uh, pulp era science fiction material you you can definitely understand very quickly the sort of uh, science fiction realm you're in with this film which it's it's pretty obvious it wears it on its sleeve and and it has a really striking opening because the the opening tells you what sort of thing you're in for uh right from the get-go it, it and to say that the opening of this film uses the technicolor process to its fullest extent to let you know you're going into a different world uh, that is an understatement this film opens with one of the most striking color openings of any film of this particular period of film history uh, where we see dr cyclops established in the laboratory bathed in this flickering brilliant green light i will say for anyone uh, who has problems with flickering lights this scene may cause some issues for you because the light is so bold uh, but it, it is a, a visually striking opening to this film and and immediately establishes who dr cyclops is where his uh, jungle lab is and that he's completely unhinged and insane <laughs> Because uh, he, he vividly uh, murders his lab partner that in there right in the opening, which it's no real secret. This 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 poor guy is not long for this world within you know 20 seconds. So it, it's it's an incredibly striking opening that sets you up for this film that to then talk about the plot a little bit uh, does take a little while to get going. The reason why most of the conversation is about the optical effects work and particularly about the the actual people being miniaturized and then the sort of chase and uh, sequences that happen after they've been miniaturized is that's what everybody remembers from this film. Uh, the, the, the actual getting to that point after that striking opening is... This is just kind of an excuse to get to the people being shrunken down and then hunted and running for their lives and trying to cope with being tiny. We have a group of scientists who are asked out to the, the lab, so they make this long and tedious journey and along the way pick up a few other stragglers and people to guide them there. So it's a, it's a group of various people who, of course, also include some comic relief characters. And once they get there, it's kind of amusing that the whole reason they brought, they're brought there is actually very... Um, to say it's a mediocre or, or um, uh, unnecessary reason to have them there is an understatement because they're basically there for two seconds and then told, oh, that's all I needed. Please go now. Um, so, of course, they decide to stick around and try and figure out what Dr. Cyclops is up to. And, of course, uh, that, that was not a good idea because <laughs> they were then subjected uh, to being, uh, being shrunken down against their will. And the, the, the real issue with the film, I think, is that the, the, our characters, our heroes of the piece, if you will, they're not given very much to do, and they're sort of stock characters. And once they're shrunken down, I think the, the big problem is 
they don't have a lot of dialogue. It's it's a lot of reaction shots. The the leader of the group who has the most dialogue, uh, the lead scientist, is played by Charles Halton, who is the very uh, famous character actor. Who you'll it's one he's one of those uh, faces that you'll recognize immediately, even if you don't know his name. And of of course, I think most people, myself included, recognize him most from the various roles he plays in a lot of classic Frank Capra films, particularly uh, It's a Wonderful Life. So it's it's a bit funny and bizarre are seeing him subjected to this and trying to retain his dignity right down to having his 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 glasses shrunken down with him as well uh but you know outside of that it's mostly about their struggle to survive and cope with this situation they find themselves in so then the fact that they don't really have any di- much of any dialogue after that it's 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 harder to associate with them because we we don't know always what they're thinking and it it doesn't really do them any favors the 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 other two notable members of of the cast are also played by uh, young actors who are just starting out and didn't have uh, much of a film career so it's it's not like this film is is peppered with a whole bunch of really great supporting players and they give all of our our heroes of the story a lot of dialogue uh, to uh, converse and try and cope with what they're going through uh, that that was the, probably the most striking thing for me because you would expect them to have have at least some dialogue but uh, as, as I said once the uh, once the shrinking actually happens there's not a whole lot of dialogue that any of of the uh, heroic characters given so most people come away with uh, looking at Albert Decker's performance as as the villainous Dr. Cyclops and uh, if you're wondering why he has that name it is explained over the course of the film uh, they they essentially by some of their actions, then he brand, rebrands himself Dr. Cyclops rather amusingly. Uh, he pretty much chews the scenery in every scene. Uh, he is wonderful, and he has the very iconic uh, bald head and thick glasses, uh, which sort of, um, the, the bald head being villainous kind of reminds me, of course, of uh, Peter Lorre's character in Mad Love, but it's a very striking looking image for a villain, uh, the, the sort of bald head combined with, with the really thick glasses and the sort of uh, jungle type outfit, because of course they're in a remote jungle location where this secret lab is hidden, and we're not always privy to what Dr. Cyclops is doing, so there's you know at least a little bit of, 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 of a mystery element there. And you do have to try and wonder how these people are, are going to get out of the scenario they find themselves in, particularly at the miniaturized size. And you know, it doesn't help then, especially that they're not really given any dialogue after a certain point. Uh, so Decker's performance is really the the one standout performance in the film because he's really the only one that's given stuff to do. <laughs> and he, he makes for a wonderful villain and also... He's not so far gone in his madness that he doesn't have a sense of humor, uh, and he co- consistently finds himself bemused by the actions of of the people he's chasing and uh, trying to observe. Because of course, again, this is all for science, mind you. You know, it's not he's not just doing this because he wants to. It's because science must be pursued, as any mad scientist would do. A lot of this could be considered, uh, you know, made up of cliches of uh, older pulp science fiction stories. But for for a film of this era there's nothing wrong with that and it is a classic in its own right and to talk about the most impressive aspect once again it, the optical effects work is is really well done it is obviously very simplistic compared to what would come later and you can tell when you know they're obviously uh, in front of a rear projection screen or there's a uh, rear projection or something being matted in and a matte shot to uh, mix in the larger footage of normal size things with our miniaturized little band so this is again stuff that would pop up 17 years later in the incredible shrinking man uh, of course that would be much more honed and refined because the entire film was based around those and he had almost 20 years of technical development since dr cyclops but dr cyclops is really the the first time that you're getting specific uh, special effects shots for this particular scenario. 
and in three strip technicolor nonetheless in 1940 which is just mind-boggling so on a technical level this film is extraordinarily impressive that it pulls all this off and because it's Cooper and Shodzak doing it and really pushing this material uh, they were of course the people to do that seeing as they were the legends who put together and actually pulled off King Kong in 1933 it's understandable that they would want to once again push the technical envelope in a adventure story and this was of course a very hard sell to try and get a studio to agree to so it's really kind of a miracle we have this film so I'm I'm much more willing to overlook the fact that the actual plot is very simplistic and uh, unfortunately our, our heroic characters don't really have a lot of character development if much of any uh, the uh, again the effects work it, it is limited to due to what was available at the time however every effect shot is really well executed even though it is you know rather obvious you can spot the seams and kind of understand how they did this uh, probably the most effective of all the effects shots uh, is where they actually mixed in practical props. They do this a couple times in the film, so it's not just uh, relying on uh, rear projection and uh, camera perspective and mat shots, but uh, the, the best example of practical effects work is this really intricate, lovely shot where Dr. Cyclops has grabbed uh, Halton's character, the lead scientist doctor, and he's uh, you know about to to uh, examine him so he's got him on his table with his notebooks and everything and obviously when we see Cyclops it's you know a, 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 once again a rear projection shot is obviously separately photographed footage and then we have uh, Charles Houghton standing with his sort of handmade togo clothing outfit uh, on the oversized uh, desk table they've built and they've got the the notebook and the, all the various things and the cup with pencils and, and uh, other bits in it but when uh, he is no longer uh, being a willing participant, shall we say, uh, all of a sudden Dr. Cyclops grabs him by, with his hand and you see this gigantic hand come in and literally grab Charles Halton and they, the fingers close around him and then kind of pick him up a little bit. So then he's just, you know, like the stereotype of a giant picking up a person and holding them in their hand, a gigantic hand, much like King Kong when, when Kong picks up uh, Fate Ray's character in Kong. Uh, but this, of course, is a, means they actually built a gigantic practical mechanical hand and it actually picks up Charles Halton. And, you know, it's it, once it comes in, once the surprise wears off after a second, you know, you can obviously tell it's a gigantic prop they built but it is so well put together and integrated into the separate footage of Decker they shot. And it is, it is perfectly matched up uh, to the action of the separate footage they, they, they photographed. So they actually paid extreme attention to match frame by frame on the movement of the two different pieces. And it really sells that sequence extremely well, particularly given how that scene ends for people who know the film. Uh, so that, that for me is the most striking effect shot in the whole film. Yes, you can tell it's literally a gigantic hand, but you know, you don't quite expect that with all the other shots being, uh, merely composites and different things. Uh, so the, the handful of practical physical effects they do are also really impressive. So it's, it's more of a film to appreciate for the time in which it was made, the technological breakthroughs, the for sort of fun, old-fashioned, pulpy science fiction story with a mad scientist, and it's also got a rather brisk runtime. It doesn't ever really drag. I, I would say the, the only thing I wish was better was uh, I, I do wish that the, our, our other characters, our heroes of the story, had had more actual character development there's there's a little bit and all the performances are good i don't want to sell them short but it's it's more of the the, the in the script they're they're a little bit more one note uh, which is something that does pop up somewhat in other cooper and shotzak films if if you really wanted to uh look at them closely that is something that does unfortunately suffer a little bit because their films are frequently focusing on the spectacle and the effects and the adventure qualities. Uh, so there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I just 
for my own tastes, I wish that uh, the the heroes of our story were, had a little bit more character development in terms of the writing, so it, it was easier to associate with them a bit more. And and you do obviously with, with the scenario they're put in, and you can't help but feel the parallels to uh, this being the precursor to the Incredible Shrinking Man, and the fact that these effects were so intricate and hard to pull off. This is why nobody really touched this subject matter <laughs> all that often. So, again, you pretty much have the Devil Doll in 1936, this film in 1940, and then, you know, with, with some exceptions here and there, it's it's not something that was done a whole lot outside of uh, various versions of, say, Tom Thumb or Thumbelina, and then you get to, of course, the uh, the, the great one in The Incredible Shrinking Man. So when you see this film, you will be thinking of the Incredible Shrinking Man throughout. Uh, and if you love the Devil Doll like I do, you'll be thinking of that film as well. So those are the two sort of uh, bookend films that predate and uh, come afterwards, that this film is sort of uh, has, a, has a foot in either camp, as it were. Uh, it is a, a, a really interesting film to see, uh, and particularly in this new restoration and this Blu-ray presentation, it is an absolute marvel. So uh, I think it uh, only gets better uh, in terms of uh, the, the more you're able to appreciate how it was put together at that particular time period in 1940, uh, and seeing it in this lovely new scan, which really makes the technical, the photography, and the effects work all the more impressive. Now, to talk about the Blu-ray release from Kino Lorber, this uses a brand new 4K scan. This is a Universal held title, so I presume it's a 4K scan directly from Universal. Uh, it looks absolutely beautiful. I'd only seen this film once before. Uh, it's not had a lot of releases. There was a, an Encore Edition Laserdisc back in the day, and then it was released as part of the Universal Sci-Fi DVD volumes. So it gets grouped in with uh, Incredible Shrinking Man and uh, a number of other uh, Universal, uh, mostly 50s uh, science fiction and 50s sort of uh, creature sci-fi films. Uh, it, it's not really part of that because it was made in 1940, so it's it's a bit of an outlier. It doesn't quite fit in with uh, 40s horror films like the the Universal uh, you know, Monster and other traditional horror films of that time, and it's also a little bit different from things Cooper and Shojack did, but it kind of has you know elements of both. Uh, so the fact that it got a Blu-ray release to begin with, I thought was was quite striking. But the fact that it actually got a 4K scan and was wonder was rather cleaned up over how it looked beforehand is reason enough alone to purchase this disc. I think the fact that we have this lovely new 4K scan and new HD master of the first three strip Technicolor horror film uh, is is really something to celebrate. So the picture quality here. It looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, this disc is worth every penny for the picture quality alone. I think this belongs in the collection of anyone who is a horror fan or who loves pulpy science fiction stories like this or anyone who is a fan of Cooper and Shodzak, particularly fans of King Kong and The Most Dangerous Game, but also fans of Three Strip Technicolor because this film... Again, it's a genre landmark for being uh, the first three-strip Technicolor horror film, period. And it looks beautiful. It's also not been over-manipulated or anything. Uh, the only things I did notice were examples of a transfer being uh, about preserving a film and really bringing the color to life without uh, over-processing things. So there are some uh, things that pop up. They are very, very minor. Uh, there is a tiny bit of frame wobble in the opening titles, which is common to most films. And then there's a teensy little bit, again, when you get to some of the uh, transitions, which of course are going to be from dupe material anyway. Uh, there is uh, no no problems with the overall image itself uh, outside of, I did notice there is one tiny hair that pops up in one scene uh, in terms of a, a visible hair in the gate. And because this is three strip Technicolor, it's, it's you know, fringed, so it actually is sort of like a green looking hair. Uh, you do see a little tiny bit of color fringing here and there. 
uh, which of course is going to be common to most any three strip technicolor element, uh, particularly uh, the most technicolor films of the three strip variety do have quite a bit of frenzing or alignment problems. It does take a lot of time and money uh, to use uh, the digital process like what uh, Warner Brothers does to go back and digitally realign every single shot so all three of the Technicolor elements are in perfect alignment. Uh, most films are going to have a little degree of, of variation in that naturally because the way they were shot, it was not a perfect process. So to see a little tiny bit of, of haloing or color fringing around a few objects here and there, like you see in this film, just to a small degree, that's to be expected. That's, that's natural. So I didn't see anything that was out of the ordinary or had really bad color fringing like you see on some Technicolor films when they're put out on video. You also see a handful, and again, a handful, like very infrequently, there are a couple of specs that appear uh, at a couple points, really just I'd say maybe two or three here and there. And of course, this being three strip Technicolor, they are themselves varying colors, which is what you're going to see on any three strip Technicolor film when there's uh, a speck or a hair or something that pops up. As I've said, it's usually going to be one of, of, the, of the three colors or a color variation somehow. So the, again, those are all uh, understandable. It's nothing that intrudes on the experience. And I would much rather see see a few things like that in an otherwise lovely looking master than for someone to go in and be heavy handed with uh, grain removal and all the nasty stuff that unfortunately happens far too often. So I think the picture transfer here is absolutely beautiful. I watched this on an OLED upscale to 4K and it looked outstanding. Uh, again, I'd only seen this film once before and it looked nowhere near this good. So um, I, I think it's a shame this hasn't gotten a UHD. I think it really deserves it. Uh, if that's ever in the cards, this would make an outstanding UHD release, particularly uh, if, if they do an HDR grading and they, they do it justice because uh, we need to get true three strip Technicolor films on UHD. They are truly important and I think would really benefit extraordinarily uh, well from the, uh, from the new format and the ability to have HDR grades and things when done properly. Uh, but that's probably not going to happen, unfortunately. But the fact that there's a 4K master, it means that it, it's possible. Uh, but in any case, this is an absolutely beautiful looking disc. It is a must own disc for the picture alone, in addition to its uh, extreme importance for uh, the technical breakthroughs and it being the first three strip Technicolor horror film. Now, in terms of the audio, we have a uh, similarly cleaned up and restored uh, mono track presented in Lossless DTS HDMA. Uh, I didn't notice any issues with this. It sounded relatively clean, but I don't own any of the previous releases. I've seen the DVD before. I've just never owned the DVD or the Laserdisc, so I don't necessarily know how this track compares to the previous releases. I do remember the DVD being obviously not as pristine as this master and the audio had a little bit of noise and it looked like they obviously used some sort of print source when they made the DVD transfer. So it's possible the audio has been improved enough and the DVD audio was a bit worse. I just don't own either previous release to physically be able to compare to this. But I think it's a wonderful sounding track. There's no uh, anomalies or uh, doesn't seem like they went uh, heavy handed with uh, noise reduction or anything. But again, I just don't have uh, physically own the previous releases to compare. But I do think the audio sounded healthy and it sounded good for a film of this era. And I think it goes along well with the new picture restoration. Now to talk about Kino's release, the artwork uses this really wonderful and of course very colorful uh, original artwork. This is a beautiful looking cover. I think it really grabs the attention immediately. And of course the bold color just jumps off the actual jacket and just entices you to uh, you know, literally pick this disc up as, as you should. Uh, you, you want the artwork for this film to be bold and colorful. Uh, the actual disc itself is just in the standard Kino Studio Classics banner with their traditional label. Uh, there, it, there, you know, it doesn't look like anything fancy, but 
course, you have to look on the back to see it's credited as the new 4K Master. And we do actually get some notable extras. We get the original trailer, which unfortunately is just in standard def. And then we get the Trailers from Hell commentary, which is always nice. Those are all, if you've never been to Trailers from Hell, just go to their website or their YouTube channel and you'll be there for days on end watching all of them. And then the real draw, though, is Richard Harlan Smith does a audio commentary, which is another great muscle and track of his he covers pretty much every bit of ground there is to cover on this film from talking about cooper and shodzak and their lives not just in their film careers but their amazing lives uh, before the, the, even getting into motion pictures uh, about the genesis of this film about the uh, where the story comes from the debate about uh, the the different versions that exist in terms of the other published uh, novelized versions of this story uh, he talks about the uh, the actors involved and the cast and crew and a lot of their biographical background it's it's a really well-informed, well-researched commentary track, uh, and for a film that is is a bit harder to cover because there's not a whole lot of information around about it outside of the notable elements, and you also have uh, main actors who didn't have a really much of a film career unfortunately so uh, he definitely had to do quite a bit of research into the cast and crew and background of this film and it's a really rewarding track all of these factors the beautiful new 4k master the lovely work that's been done to this the lovely artwork the very inexpensive price and uh, being topped off by a great commentary track uh, this is one of the must-own Kino discs, I think. It is one of their great releases. It's one of their absolute must-own titles. Uh, simply for the picture quality alone, even if you're not uh, a genre fan, uh, it's an absolutely beautiful-looking master for a film that hasn't been talked about very much, and it is a very important, groundbreaking film for the horror and science fiction genres. It is the first genre film to be photographed and released in three-strip technicolor and is filled with effects work, as which, of course, befits the fact that it was made by the legendary team of Cooper and Shodzak. So this is a must for fans of King Kong. This is a must for Technicolor fans. It's a must for genre fans. And it's a must if you're simply looking for a really beautiful looking disc uh, from Kino Lorber that actually does have some really great substantial extras. So uh, don't let this one pass you by. It's one of their absolute best releases. It is one of their must-own titles, and uh, it, I'm just really so pleased that this film has gotten such a beautiful Blu-ray release because I was able to really rediscover this, and you will just be marveling the whole time at how beautiful this film looks uh, in this HD presentation. Uh, again, it's worth every penny for the picture quality alone. So those are my thoughts on the Kino Lorber Blu-ray release of Dr. Cyclops, which is a science fiction fantasy horror classic from the team of Cooper and Shodzak. And I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't see this as a kid, because if you see this as a kid, it, it definitely is nightmare fuel. <laughs> it's one of those, uh, like Incredible Shrinking Man, there, there's plenty of nightmare fuel to, if, if you're, uh, if you see this as a very young kid, and I'm sure it's really spooked a lot of kids in 1940 because there's not really anything you could compare this to uh, coming out at, at that point in time. Uh, so this this is a film that's beloved by many who, who've seen it over the years. Uh, it's, it's a film that I wish was talked about a bit more because it's extraordinarily impressive for uh, the constraints of, of, of its production at the time in 1940 and topped off by being produced in three-strip Technicolor when it was still extremely cumbersome to do so. Uh, so you, you really Really appreciate the hard work and effort that go into this film uh, as you're watching it. Uh, we, we, if you have that sort of background of knowing all the constraints of, of a 1940 Technicolor film, uh, it just makes you really appreciate every last shot and sequence that you see here and, and how well executed the whole enterprise is. So I, I do extremely, uh, with my highest recommendation, encourage you to check out this release from Kino Lord 
Lorber, it's the best release the film has ever had. Uh, the uh, Richard Harlan Smith commentary is excellent, uh, which makes this an even more enticing purchase. And again, I do think this is one of the essential must-own uh, Kino Lorber discs, which is saying something because they have so many disc releases. Uh, it's sometimes hard to sift through and find the ones that are new masters and have extras and are really dramatic upgrades over previous editions, and this one really is. I mean, if you've seen this film before and you pop this disc in, you will know from the opening frames how much of a night and day improvement this is. Like I said, I'd seen it before on DVD, and uh, it, the intricacies of the Technicolor photography and everything, uh, you know, I had an idea of it, but I didn't really marvel over it and, uh, until seeing this presentation on Blu-ray. So, uh, again, this is a must-own Kino disc. It is absolutely a must-own uh, for genre importance, historical significance, and the picture quality is absolutely beautiful. So uh, I hope this has been somewhat fun and informative to once again hear me babble on about classic films. Uh, as always, I encourage everyone to keep supporting both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc, which helps keep physical media alive and preserves film culture and supports film restoration work. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.